antiphospholipid antibodies, all women with recurrent first trimester miscarriage, and all women with one or more second trimester miscarriage should be screened before pregnancy for antiphospholipid antibodies. To diagnose antiphospholipid syndrome, it is mandatory that the woman has two positive tests at least 12 weeks apart for either lupus anticoagulant or anticardiolipin antibodies of immunoglobulin G and or immunoglobulin M class present in a medium or high titer over 40 grams per liters or milliliters per liters or above the 99th percentile. In the detection of lupus anticoagulant, the dilute Russell's Viper Venom Time Test, together with a platelet neutralization procedure, is more sensitive and specific than either the activated partial thromboplastin time test or the Kaolin clotting time test. Anticardiolipin antibodies are detected using a standardized enzyme link immunosorbent assay. The detection of antiphospholipid antibodies is subject to considerable interlaboratory variation. This is a result of temporal fluctuation of antiphospholipid antibody titers in individual women, transient positivity secondary to infections, suboptimal sample collection, and preparation and lack of standardization of laboratory tests for their detection. Karyotyping Cytogenetic analysis should be performed on products of conception on the third and subsequent consecutive miscarriage or miscarriages. Parental peripheral blood karyotyping of both partners should be performed in couples with recurrent miscarriage for testing of products of conception reports an unbalanced structural chromosomal abnormality. Knowledge of the karyotype of the products of conception allows an informed prognosis for a future pregnancy outcome to be given. While a sporadic fetal chromosome abnormality is the most common cause of any single miscarriage, the risk of miscarriage as a result of fetal aneuploidy decreases with an increasing number of pregnancy losses. If the karyotype of the miscarried pregnancy is abnormal, there is a better prognosis for the next pregnancy. Routine karyotyping of couples with recurrent miscarriage cannot be justified. Anatomical factors All women with recurrent first trimester miscarriage and all women with one or more second trimester miscarriages should have a pelvic ultrasound to assess uterine anatomy. Suspected uterine anomalies may require further investigations to confirm the diagnosis using hysteroscopy, laparoscopy, or three-dimensional pelvic ultrasound. A review of studies comparing the diagnostic accuracy of various imaging modalities has reported that two-dimensional ultrasound scanning and or hysterosalpingography can be used as an initial screening test. Combine hysteroscopy and laparoscopy, and possibly three-dimensional ultrasound scanning should be used for a definitive diagnosis. The value of magnetic resonance imaging scanning remains undetermined. Thrombophilias Women with second trimester miscarriage should be screened for inherited thrombophilias, including factor V latin, factor II protrombin gene mutation, and protein S. A meta-analysis of retrospective studies has reported a strong association between second trimester miscarriage and inherited thrombophilias, factor V laden, factor II protrombin gene mutation, and protein S deficiency. Treatment options for recurrent miscarriage What are the treatment options for recurrent first trimester and second trimester miscarriage? Women with recurrent miscarriage should be offered referral to a specialist clinic. Antiphospholipid syndrome Pregnant women with antiphospholipid syndrome should be considered for treatment with low-dose aspirin plus heparin to prevent further miscarriage. The only treatment or treatment combination that leads to a significant increase in the live birth rate among women with antiphospholipid syndrome 
is aspirin plus unfractionated heparin. This treatment combination significantly reduces the miscarriage rate by 54%. Two small prospective studies reported no difference in efficacy and safety between unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin when combined with aspirin in the treatment of women with recurrent miscarriage associated with antiphospholipid antibodies. There are no adverse fetal outcomes reported in the meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials of low-dose aspirin for the prevention of preeclampsia in pregnancy. Heparin does not cross the placenta and hence there is no potential to cause fetal hemorrhage or teratogenicity. Heparin can, however, be associated with maternal complications including bleeding, hypersensitivity reactions, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and when used long-term, osteopenia and vertebral fractures. The loss of bone mineral density at the lumbar spine associated with low-dose long-term heparin therapy is similar to that which occurs physiologically during normal pregnancy. Low molecular weight heparin is as safe as unfractionated heparin and has potential advantages during pregnancy since it causes less heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, can be administered once daily, and is associated with a lower risk of heparin-induced osteoporosis. Pregnancies associated with antiphospholipid antibodies treated with aspirin and heparin remain at high risk of complications during all three trimesters. Although aspirin plus heparin treatment substantially improves the live birth rate of women with recurrent miscarriage associated with antiphospholipid antibodies, these pregnancies remain at high risk of complications during all three trimesters, including repeated miscarriage, preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, and preterm birth. This necessitates careful antenatal surveillance. Neither corticosteroids nor intravenous immunoglobulin therapy improve the live birth rate of women with recurrent miscarriage associated with antiphospholipid antibodies compared with other treatment modalities. Their use may provoke significant maternal and fetal morbidity. Genetic factors the finding of an abnormal parental karyotype should prompt referral to a clinical geneticist. Genetic counseling offers the couple a prognosis for the risk of future pregnancies with an unbalanced chromosome complement and the opportunity for familial chromosome studies. Reproductive options in couples with chromosomal rearrangement include proceeding to a further natural pregnancy with or without a prenatal diagnosis test, gamete donation, and adoption. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis has been proposed as a treatment option for translocation carriers. Since pre-implantation genetic diagnosis necessitates that the couple undergo in vitro fertilization to produce embryos, couples with proven fertility need to be aware of the financial costs as well as implantation and live birth rates per cycle following in vitro fertilization or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Furthermore, they should be informed that they have a higher 50 to 70% chance of a healthy live birth in future untreated pregnancies following natural conception than is currently achieved after pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or in vitro fertilization, approximately 30%. Pre-implantation genetic screening with in vitro fertilization treatment in women with unexplained recurrent miscarriage does not improve live birth rates. Anatomical factors Congenital uterine malformations There is insufficient evidence to assess the effect of uterine septum resection in women with recurrent miscarriage and uterine septum to prevent further miscarriage, cervical weakness, and cervical cerclage. Cervical cerclage is associated with potential hazards related to the surgery 
and the risk of stimulating uterine contractions and hence should be considered only in women who are likely to benefit. Women with a history of second trimester miscarriage and suspected cervical weakness who have not undergone a history indicated cerclage may be offered serial cervical sonographic surveillance. In women with a single thon pregnancy and a history of one second trimester miscarriage attributable to cervical factors, an ultrasound indicated cerclage should be offered if a cervical length of 25 millimeters or less is detected by transvaginal scan before 24 weeks of gestation. A short cervical length on transvaginal ultrasound during pregnancy may be useful in predicting preterm birth in some cases of suspected cervical weakness. A meta-analysis of individual patient-level data from four randomized controlled trials reported that in a subgroup analysis of women with a single thon pregnancies at short cervix less than 25 millimeters and previous second trimester miscarriage cerclage may reduce the incidence of preterm birth before 35 weeks of gestation transabdominal cerclage has been advocated as a treatment for second trimester miscarriage and the prevention of early preterm labor in selected women with a previous failed transvaginal cerclage and or a very short and scarred cervix. Endocrine factors. There is insufficient evidence to evaluate the effect of progesterone supplementation in pregnancy to prevent a miscarriage in women with recurrent miscarriage. Progesterone is necessary for successful implantation and the maintenance of pregnancy. This benefit of progesterone could be explained by its immunomodulatory actions in inducing a pregnancy protective shift from pro-inflammatory TH1 cytokine responses to a more favorable anti-inflammatory TH2 cytokine response. A large multicenter study, or PROMISE, that can be found on www medscnet.net slash promise is currently underway to assess the benefit of progesterone supplementation in women with unexplained recurrent miscarriage. There is insufficient evidence to evaluate the effect of human chorionic gonadotropin supplementation in pregnancy to prevent a miscarriage in women with recurrent miscarriage. Suppression of high luteinizing hormone levels among ovulatory women with recurrent miscarriage and polycystic ovaries does not improve the live birth rate. Luteinizing hormone hypersecretion, a frequent feature of polycystic ovary syndrome, has been reported as a risk factor for early pregnancy loss. There is insufficient evidence to evaluate the effect of metformin supplementation in pregnancy to prevent a miscarriage in women with recurrent miscarriage. Immunotherapy, paternal cell immunization, third-party donor leukocytes, trophoblast membranes, and intravenous immunoglobulin in women with previous unexplained recurrent miscarriage does not improve the live birth rate. Moreover, immunotherapy is expensive and has potentially serious adverse effects including transfusion reaction, anaphylactic shock, and hepatitis. There are no published data on the use of anti-tumor necrosis factor agents to improve pregnancy outcome in women with recurrent miscarriage. Furthermore, anti-tumor necrosis factor agents could potentially cause serious morbidity, including lymphoma, granulomatous disease such as tuberculosis, demyelinating disease, congestive heart failure, and syndromes similar to systemic lupus erythematosus, inherited thrombophilias. There is insufficient evidence to evaluate the effect of heparin in pregnancy to prevent a miscarriage in women with recurrent first trimester miscarriage associated with inherited thrombophilia. Heparin therapy during pregnancy may improve the live birth rate of women with second trimester miscarriage associated with inherited thrombophilias. 
unexplained recurrent miscarriage. Women with unexplained recurrent miscarriage have an excellent prognosis for future pregnancy outcome without pharmacological intervention if offered supportive care alone in the setting of a dedicated early pregnancy assessment unit. A significant proportion of cases of recurrent miscarriage remain unexplained despite detailed investigation. This woman can be reassured that the prognosis for a successful future pregnancy with supportive care alone is in the region of 75%. However, the prognosis worsens with increasing maternal age and the number of previous miscarriages. Attendance at the dedicated early pregnancy clinic has a beneficial effect, although the mechanism is unclear. The use of empirical treatment in women with unexplained recurrent miscarriage is unnecessary and should be resisted.